Welcome to the Institutions of Post-Conflict Governance. This is our first mini-lecture, which will focus on why states fail and what we can do about it. There are many factors that contribute to state failure. Some of them are political systems crisis, ineffective power sharing, insurgencies, bad economic policies, corruption, unresolved past grievances, ineffective ways of dealing with the past, etc. We can take the example of Syria to expound on the, on the definition of failed state. Common characteristics of a failing state include a central government so weak or ineffective that it has little practical control over much of its territory and there is non-provision of public services. When this happens, widespread corruption and criminality take place, the intervention of non-state actors, the, appear the appearance of refugees and the involuntary movement of populations, as well as sharp economic decline can occur. Weak and failing states pose a challenge to the international community. Unable to provide security and basic human needs to its citizens, but also the negative ripple effects from weak and failing states can affect others. The reason for state weakness and failure uh, are complex but not unpredictable. We need to pay more attention to prevention. When Rothberg talks about preventive efforts, he mentions that preventive efforts, though not always successful, are better and cheaper than reconstruction and reconciliation post-conflict. Failure of states often goes hand in hand with conflict. The focus of this course is on what happens after the violent conflict and how countries can be reconstructed. Post-conflict reconstruction includes activities between the cessation of violent conflict and the return to normalization. While primary responsibility for reconstruction must lie with indigenous actors, international intervention is often critical during the early stages of post-conflict transition. Post-conflict reconstruction activities include those focusing on establishing basic security, stability and emergency services, rebuilding economy, establishing mechanisms for governance and participation, and securing a foundation of justice and reconciliation which may be most difficult and prolonged because of its focus on socio-cultural fabric of the society and relationships. All of these activities are overlapping. They are complementary and they should be happening at the same time. Different institutions, structures and agents are participating in post-conflict reconstruction and we can say that there are top-down and bottom-up approaches. This image represents a comprehensive model of post-conflict reconstruction or dealing with the past in which we can distinguish various top-down and bottom-up approaches. This model was developed by the Department of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland and Swiss Peace in 2006 and it is based on Joinet Ornklicher principles. The model consists of four quadrants which all represent different areas of concern and approaches to post-conflict reconstruction. These are right to know, right to reparation, right to justice, and guarantee of non-recurrence. In the middle, we have victims and perpetrators as central groups that post-conflict societies are focusing on in their attempts to heal and recover. Two arrows pointing to conflict transformation and reconciliation show the final outcome or overarching goal of the said approaches. Let us now consider the definition of post-conflict peace building. UN Secretary General introduced in his uh, Agenda for Peace in 1992 a comprehensive definition of the concept of post-conflict peace building. In brief, it is a demilit de demilitarization deployed together with the necessary cessation of activities which cause population suffering such as discontinuation of human rights violations, repatriating refugees and providing support to traumatized people, as well as building of democratic institutions and practices. 
The extent to which the post-conflict peace building will be implemented, its dynamics and effects, will depend on the extent which society opted for them. The local community has to take ownership of the process and play the major role. Model that fits all is impossible. The approaches need to be tailored to the particular context. Peace building is a dynamical response to an environment in confl of conflict that successfully moves the human relational system towards self-organization and self-correction. Conflict causes disturbance and disorder. Institutions are out of sync with each other. Society needs to be ready to start the process of self-correction. One of the most important tasks of the third party or peace builder's roles is getting the data right and careful analysis of the situation done in partnership with local people. Another important role of peace builders is communicating and engaging in dialogic processes with all stakeholders. Another important point is that peace building requires integrated, synchronized and coordinated efforts and activities which would help societies to outgrow the war mentality and implement new policies and ways of behavior. There is no peace building monopoly and many different actors working together from individuals to international organizations and states. Let's just mention few. Political and military actors, economic entrepreneurs, members of civil society, citizens, etc. You can also play a role in peace building as a professional, as a scholar or an activist. Thank you for listening.